for now. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do in this uh, sec third session is uh, try to uh, bring a high-level view to the computing requirements. So we've talked about several approaches uh, in um, details about an, um, the types of analysis that we'd like to see, the kinds of data we want to ensure are available, and the challenges in getting to them. So rather than go through a lot of slides, I just wanted to go to a high level and talk about process. There's a lot of questions in the white paper that were raised by the writing group. I um, encourage you all to look at that. I don't think we're going to find the answers to all of that here, but I uh, was going to try to uh, pull for some consensus and, and, and raise some points, at least how we're seeing this strategically at the archives. And this is work that I've talked about a lot with Paul and others. Um, so I, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about what I think are the shape of the data because that will drive what's available and then talk about the uh, framework for getting access to it. So conceptually, we can think of uh, all of this data now as a giant virtual two-dimensional matrix. So we think of everyone around the world that's been typed or sequences. We could think of them as columns. The nice feature about genomic data is that it gives us an organizing principle, in this case, rows or positions in the genome. We could rank this out for 3 billion bases, and then at the bottom, we could add space for alternate loci, which are going to be variably present in different individuals, and unplaced sequence or rearrangements that might be specific to cancer cells, tumors, whatever exotica come up. Uh, each cell in this little uh, cartoon is actually a complex object, and I think this is where uh, a lot of the engineering conversation will happen because what you're trying to save in this area are, is a space that contains sequence information, genotypes, and haplotypes. And here I'm just blowing it up. And so at that position of a person in a genome, uh, we still have questions about the underlying sequence evidence, and there's, uh, uh, there's a conversation, I think Lincoln raised the question yesterday about would it be available to see reads, and yes, we want to keep the reads, we want to keep the qualities for the reads in some lossy yet informative way, information about alignment, quality, mate pairs, um, the production tags, who they came from, what instrumentation, et cetera. That's all been done right now in a CSRA or CRAM format. This is BAM. Uh, that has been optimized for storage at uh, EBI or NCBI. Others can think of, you know, ways to uh, compress the data locally as well. Uh, in the most extreme condensed space, it might be considered genotypes, where you have a simple case where there's just a, a couple of alleles or differences from reference. You might want to also keep information about ancestral states, allele counts, properties of uh, population genetics, all stored down here. In this other third space, which we're just starting to work with it as a community, is the haplotype information. I mean, I think we have imputation down and we can talk about imputed genotypes, but we're going to be quickly moving to a space where we can start looking at physical as well as statistically phased haplotypes of longer length. They're going to have frequencies. They're probably going to have phenotypes in a compound mutational sense that's different from the phenotypes or the variants, uh, functional consequences expressed individually. So collectively, this is the space where we think we're working in over the next three to five X number of years. Um, all of this needs to be, remembered connected to publications and clinical assertions or aggregate data sources such as dbSNP, dbVar, EGV, whatever. So you have individual measures that are in the controlled access uh, elements here, and then you would have aggregate summaries. Um, the, row, uh, the columns in this virtual global matrix are are the, the natural unit of collection. These are individuals that are being sequenced, and they typically are housed uh, or in a repository um, that are partitioned by archives. It might be a central archive, such as dbGaP or EG, EGV. It might be a cloud provision service. It might be hospital healthcare services. You know, so we can imagine that what we want to reach through and access globally won't be housed in any one place or even in a few places. There's going to be stewardship responsibilities across the world. There's going to be some sort of minimal ethical oversight we talk about DACs, and I'm using that in the shorthand sense of oversight. But you know, we've, I think we've all agreed that in the special case um, of pure public access, that we can set, maybe isolate and um, permit free access to data. That's that's in play, but it's probably not the global solution. So where there, are, especially for healthcare and, and other systems, there's going to be legal requirements of countries and oversight groups that we're trying to harmonize. Uh, we know that there's national legislation that governs some of this, 
but you know, having a body that can organize conversations at this level is important if we really want to think about queries that slice through horizontally through what's the possible answers you could get through the world. In reality, the data that will come to us are going to look more like this. Not every study is going to examine every base in the genome. Not every study will look at placements on alternate clinical haplotypes or remember unplaced data. So when you do queries, you're going to have to expect that in some places that the uh, space will be richly covered and in other places it might be sparse. So uh, the data right now are being transported uh, in BAM format uh, to the archives uh, and in VCF format for the genotypes. We don't have robust standards for phenotype data, for uh, epigenetic environmental data, or even, I'd say even for haplotypes right now. And that's an area that uh, it will profit to try to standardize because tools work best when they know what the data is going to look like. Um, so stepping back from the shape of the data and looking at process flow, uh, we've talked about several um, uh, designs for access to the data, and computing requirements really fo follow from requirements. Uh, and specifications which haven't been articulated. So I can't really talk much to what's the right solution because we, I don't think we have a handle on the problem or the right data flow other than maybe all of the above, which you and others have proposed. So what I talked to, I think maybe in a kind of a time order, uh, is thinking about what we have right now. We have the approved user working through a DAX system that has access to uh, repository data, and I'm saying gated in the sense that it's controlled, it's not public access. Uh, we've talked about how this can be partitioned by consent into uh, categories that maybe have exceptional requirements and care because they're sensitive in nature. And then we have a typical study that has consent that's either very broad use or maybe narrow use, uh, individual disease or, or nonprofit use only. And sometimes studies will span this area. Part of the individuals will consent to broad use, and another subset of the individuals in the study elect for a more restrictive consent. And so. When we talk about uh, creating access for broad use data, we're talking about just those individuals that have given broad reuse consent, and it might not be the full complement of a study. Something that NCBI and NIH are doing to try to expedite access to aggregate data for this broad use and try to create a lightweight system uh, in the absence of showing all p-values, and I'd like to say I agree with Mark Daly's comments last night, we really need to think about the risk question about getting access to the data. Uh, for aggregates. But in absence of that, the CADA, or what we're calling the Combined Aggregate Data Analysis Set, this is, Laura, did I get that right? <laughs> this is going to be a new expedited uh, release study at NIH that we're packaging the broad use consent in for uh, uh, rapid access. With one request, you can get a year's access to all submitted GWAS results, all p-values. Um, and, and that's still going to go through the DAX system. I'm losing my pointer here. But uh, it will hopefully be a, a faster process. Um, we are also looking at data compression services to help remove the burden of the transaction and downloading data when you have approval to use broad use samples, thousands, tens of thousands of samples. So this is going to be BAM slicing and compression services that make the footprint smaller for what you want to uh, lower. We're also, as talked about, um, trying to create uh, centralized review for large projects and try to minimize the impact of the stack governance layer. What we need, I think, in, in this broad use category is that if we can recalculate the aggregate data just on those individuals, we will have a harmonized set of individuals and their aggregate measures that could be uh, broadly uh, used um, and they will be lightly, uh, um, um, we're trying to minimize the barriers to uptake. And if there was agreement or discussion on how to do the recalculations to call variants, to do the p-values for GWAS studies on a select number of traits, that could be done this summer and we could actually have data as early as fall for the GRU studies where we have both a, an aggregate data set and individual level data that have been matched and, and are harmonized and, and, and interinterpretable so you have the individuals that go into the values. Uh, and that's something we could do today without a lot of uh, engineering discussion. It's just will and, and planning. Uh, the other thing we've talked about now moving a little bit farther out is the idea of the certified user. This is what Ewan introduced last night is removing or, or reversing the approval. So a, a person that's been uh, duly certified has, is pre-approved for access to this broad use 
research commons area. Again, this could come with services such as slicing and compression and optimization, so it's still a lightweight transaction, uh, just like uh, we're planning to do over here. Uh, the advantage is that you don't have to go through the DAC process on a, on a uh, basis, and this might open it up to the serendipitous discoveries. Uh, a bit farther out, uh, because this requires a bit more our, our planning and, and, and architecture, are cloud-based storage and solution models. Again, here we're thinking that uh, certified users would have access to the broad use data. This is the research commons in a cloud. The advantage here is that it has uh, compute access next to the data. So you could bring up local data, compute on it in addition to what's available in the uh, research commons and do it locally rather than dragging all the data down to your local environment. Uh, our optimization proposal here would be thinking that you don't want to store everything that's ever been published on a broad use sample in a cloud because storage is an expensive component. You pay to push data up and you pay per month for it to sit there. So it's better to just store the data and cache what's been used or requested by users. That could be done in a process that uh, then grows a cache of useful data as defined by the community requests. Uh, and all we need to do that is to uh, change or, or modify some of our policies on uh, security so that we can create uh, single footprints of data that are reusable by lots of people rather than these personalized encryption copies that we're doing right now. And that's just a nuance in NIH policy. But I think it's, uh, we, what we're saying is that there are equivalent protections that could uh, allow us uh, uh, efficiencies of scale in, in cloud solutions. And then finally, there's a discussion that we've uh, talked about, which is uh, uh, separating the analysis services and abstracting them into a cloud layer. Uh, this could be operated in a third-party cloud, or analysis services could be extensions of the repositories themselves. It could be a virtualized website or someplace you go to. So I'm, I'm just drawing it kind of in the abstract. But what's going to happen is that users are going to make requests to these uh, services where tools could run. So this is a platform environment. Uh, on the back end, they're going to uh, be tra having transactions and access to data. If the data are in the cloud, you know, maybe these two clouds are the same thing, then this dotted line is simply reaching across a firewall. If this cloud is sitting at a service, maybe this dotted line here is actually reaching across an interior firewall and you're just reading off the local disks. But what we're missing in all of this, and I think there was some discussion last night and uh, the thoughts about how do we just construct the payload for the request? It's going to have to have properties of the query, properties about the requesting user, and properties about the data itself. And there's that logic of how do you square all three of those together to say, do I have a well-formed request with an answer that I have permission to ask and the data has permission to give an answer to? So if we solve that problem, we have an analysis function. Finally, there might be a subset of that analysis function that is safe enough that we could say it's public. You don't need to be a certified user. So now you could have analysis services that students can run, that postdocs can run, that people that are junior to the trade or in public and educational systems can actually interact with the data too. So deciding what tools and what services and what functions are in this category versus a certified user category is a risk calculation. There needs to be a body like this or somebody that's going to do the uh, decision making. So again, from computing, what I've drawn here are a lot of arrows uh, in time. This is done fast. I think co compute and cloud could be done second or certified users possibly done second depending on the governance issues. And then finally, this could follow as long as we have uh, standard platforms and the tools are running in a platform environment. Um, requirements are needed for all of this to talk about costs or timelines. This is, I think, more conceptual. So final slide, I think the elements that we would need for a general platform for computing on data are fivefold right now. Uh, I think we need standards for security that are going to permit many people to access source copies of the data and move away from the personalized encryption copy. Um, I think there's many technical possibilities here. Don has mentioned several. Um, and it's just a conversation uh, with engineering. Uh, if, if there's a will to understand that uh, for some slight elevation in risk of having a central encrypted copy or a virtualization of access, you can enjoy a lot of benefits and savings on space because you only have to keep a few copies of the data. Um, I've mentioned before that data presentation standards. Right now, there is a organic method for how they evolve. Uh, it's been uh, well crafted in the leading projects like Thousand Genomes and TCGA. Uh, I think that you know either these projects move into the challenges of haplotypes, phenotypes, environmental <coughs> representation, or other groups will. 
But until there's standards, it's really hard to get tools to work because you don't know what to expect. So I think we're halfway there in the problem, and that's an area for uh, uh, maybe some investment by uh, funding agencies. Um, the messaging structures I've mentioned, if we're going to talk about these global distributed analysis and queries, then this is the, the ATM analogy. You know, why do ATMs work? Because the engineers got together 15, 30 years ago, and they came up with a standard encrypted payload, and it talk, that's how the machines talk to each other. You know, and not everyone can use it. You're in the system if you do. It's part of what defines the platform. We need to have that conversation to realize David's dream of, you know, a vigorous ecosystem. Um, and, and I think that's doable, but I think there's a lot of details in that because of the flexible nature of consent. It's an unbounded problem in a way. Uh, international coordination for policy and requirements. This isn't a computing issue, but the requirements directly govern computing. So I think that you, you want an international body that can have conversations to harmonize policy and requirements to the degree possible. Uh, if we really want to imagine query systems that can reach across countries and aggregate data, they have to follow the same principles. ATMs, again, work because internationally we're all using the same messaging system within Visa, within MasterCard, within pick your flavor. Um, finally, this uh, point of uh, special attention for the research common studies. If we really want to get aggregate data that is well matched to the individual level data and commensurate, then we might need to do some immediate recalculation of the data, calling the variance, computing the p-values, uh, whatever we want so that we have a harmonized set. And I'm going to finish with that saying that's something we could do now. We have a framework for distributing it. It's just taking the will of the group to say that this is important and this is going to be helpful to the community for the work involved. Because in some ways it's a redo. But we think it's an important redo so that we have controlled access data with all of the properties the way we do for 1,000 genomes and public access samples. And so with that, I'll stop and just, I think, open this up for discussion. Thanks. So my first question is that how many subjects you have in that um, broad use data? Um, Laura, do you know how many studies are in GRU? It's something like eight, 19 studies in um, the first pilot. The first pilot. Um, in, so that's, I want to say tens of thousands, but don't hold me to the number because I haven't actually seen it, sir. And is that genotype or exome data? It would be a mixture. It would be anything that's general research use. Is the way that the list is being constructed is by the consent category. Uh, things that are exome now are expected to probably turn into full genome in another couple of years. It would also include some studies that are just array-based data. So, so in order to answer your question, uh, we would need to know what is the phenotype with, associated with those 10,000 or how much samples, right? Yes. And the other one which I was very intrigued about is your diagram and how the different users have been, uh, or use cases really have been uh, thought through in that, that context. And since I'm from industry, I'm especially interested in how that this whole access policy and everything, this structure would work for industrial researchers. So right now, the approved user model is industrial research permitted. I mean, there's no exclusion for that. People from industry can make application to access the data in the system. Um, what I'm imagining is, and so I did not draw the line, but the approved user could, certain, uh, could put their data in an isolated system. I think it's permissible to do it in a cloud if it's configured correctly. I, I'm looking to Laura because I don't know if we've actually solved or answered that question. It depends. It depends. <laughs> okay. Um, you could certainly think, put it behind a would, firewall at your own institution. Yeah, but also it will be very important to really understand how it works because we also do team science instead of individual scientists, right? Yes. So how that would work because it's not an approved user, right? It's multiple people working on a project or multiple projects within one company. So how is that all worked so, out? So right so. now, companies are the agents of agreement for doing approved users. And so uh, every organization or company would have to have an individual uh, agreement in place saying to use the data. Then it could be pulled. They could all access it and, and compute on it. But essentially, everyone's covered by a use agreement mm -hmm. saying you know that they're agreeing to the terms of use. Uh, I think the so I ambition. I would love to discuss this further. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. I think the ambition is that we would imagine there are centralized compute environments that support international collaboration. And increasingly, that's where science is going, and that's where you get the power. So it's just getting the policy conversations in place, you know, to to make sure that this can work. And then below that, getting the engineering in place so that we can 
you know, ensure everyone has, un, you know, uh, efficient access to the, re the request system. I know that in some countries, uh, requesting data as an approved user has been difficult because of nuances of the ERA system and whether your institution is registered, but that could be solved. You know, and then the certified user could be solved. I saw questions over here. Is it Richard? Yeah, Steve. Um, if you do all your developments through summer into fall, uh, and at that point, how does your model overlap with what Mark presented for the central server model? What are the key differences? And, and I guess the applications layer is an obvious one, but apart from that, I, I think that the, the key difference here is that we're we're talking about the data, actually the data that would be served in a pre-calculated way. Uh, the things that we're so going to be distributing now and that we, so, we, we show on browsers could be done uh, in, in ch as, a, as a special data set that is keyed to just the Research Commons data. So essentially, if Research Commons is what we're calling broad use, we would want to make sure that we have aggregate data and displays that are matched to those samples so if someone did a calculation, they'd get the same answer. Because right now you're not guaranteed to get it because you're missing 20 percent of the people. So it would be, a, a, in a sense, a data content difference yes. with overlapping functionality apart from the application yes. layer. Yes. And, and, and it's probably restricted in, its, in, in, it, in the content space, meaning that we're not talking about redoing all analysis, but I think you would want to call the variants and get their support scores and possibly p-values to select traits, not all traits. I, don't, I think that's the conversation to have of what would be in space for doing the calculation. But that could all be pre-prepared. Well, I also think, I mean, there's a, a clear question of, you know, do we want to, because of the technical complexity of these things, I mean, do we, do we want to have, does it not make sense to have multiple instantiations that have different goals or values? Because I, I, I think this is the, a good model, but I wouldn't want to have just one. These are all meant to be plural. Yes, I, so, so not, so this is, yes, I, then I guess it's a question of, so when you say that, I mean, you're saying this seems very much what you've built now. You mean you're saying that you would imagine instantiating entirely other models similar to this outside of? You know, I don't think. I think I, I, I'm concerned that things that are the same are being, we're trying to figure out what's different between things that are the same. So what I'm seeing here, maybe I've got it wrong. So you're trying to create, what I saw in your slides was policies, regulations, standards. Mm -hmm. that would make it possible to have these kind of interactions. Yes. You might be responsible right now for a big data store. You might yourself calculate some things, but you're providing a framework in which research commons could be created by others. Yes. They could have an analysis server or not. So what I'm saying, like, I think it's the same. It's just exactly who would do what isn't exactly clear, but I'm not hearing that it's that different. I'm hearing this is a framework in which such things could be done. That's right. I'm, I'm trying to say there's a, we're missing a few pieces of infrastructure to let the people talk and exactly. let the problem advance. But I don't think it's actually different. I think it's the same. I, yeah. I, I think we could, uh, you know, break out what, what exactly these pieces are, and I think you're pretty much right about it. Yeah. So <clears throat> one is a policy framework for getting at a common data set. That's the general, separating out the general research use and a streamlined access mode to get to those. <clears throat> There's a, a second step, which is um, providing the pre-computed summary data. Um, we ourselves would not necessarily do that. Um, so, some group would do it and provide it, or there could be two or three groups that do it different ways and provide it, but you could access that and it's keyed to that data set which solves this sort of impedance mismatch uh, that's there now. Um, and then there's also a few API tools here. You can get it all. Um, and then there's some tools to give you vertical slices uh, based on genome coordinates through it. Um, we're not offering at this, this point sort of rationalized phenotypes, but if there was the will to pick some phenotypes and recompute associations that could be done, again, not necessarily by us, but, uh, and deposited back again. Um, but none of that is sort of on-demand analysis tools. Um, the other piece that Steve is saying, which is a little, looking a little further out, is now moving the compute environment out a little bit with this idea of sort of a commonly encrypted file, some technologies to make it accessible to a cloud en environment and uh, the security there. But that's still, that's sort of platform as a service. It's still not software as a service. There's uh, 
other people would be building software as a, on top of that. Um, and then there's the issue with the software as a service layer is control access to that software. Who can see the results of that? And that's kind of his little model in the corner. That's uh, even further out there, I'd say, is, uh, is how you decide that. Right, and I'm just, it, 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 to get to all of the above is all I'm trying to say is Ewan's point and people made last night that if we want to imagine that all of these have a role, you know, in, in trying, because they're going to serve different user communities, to get to all of the above, there's just some dotted line work we have to do in policy around uh, making standards so that the tools have a place to, to compute and that the queries are interpretable. You know, that it's not some but, but I'd like to reemphasize the timeline here so that the timeline is starting in July, a step could be taken, um, which is to have some general research use data available, streamline access, and a group such as this one doing some of this, deciding what the appropriate summary computes are, doing them, making them available. And even if it's not the, the greatest number of individuals, the ultimate number you'd want, it's, your, it's basically your step forward. It's a toe in the water to, to doing this. Is that the 50% there well, kind of? And we can, we, we, we can summarize what will be in the general research group and send that summary yeah. but out I guess to this group. Is you, it, this is your instantiation of a s particular set of ways of doing this, right? It's, for instance, you've decided how you want to recall variants, how you want to do processing. How, and I think it's important no. to allow no, diversity. No, no, we're, we're, not, no, we're, that, we're not deciding then, how to then, do that. Uh, then I don't understand what, what are you saying? And what We're trying to say a 50% win might be can we package the world's data okay. for general research use in a way that you can in one stroke get access to individual data and the useful pre-computes, however the community defines them, and then that's available. We don't have the tools or the platform, but what we could do now is make the data collected. Oh, okay. and not have to do 100 million different requests through different committees. Can we do that, and is, is that an incremental win? Right. These guys have said multiple, I just think Tana is in this room, in all rooms, people hear things that weren't said. They've said multiple times, we might not compute it ourselves. They just said it would be computed, right? So there could be some pre-computes, and whatever the right way to get the computer, which could be one, out, could be you guys doing them, could be outsourcing them, could be four different versions, and someone has to agree which one's the best. There could be, but, but there would be something that could be used to query and access the data. I think that we're actually in violent agreement here. Yes. I, I, maybe the conceptual way to think about it is right now data are packaged by studies and studies are submitted. Yeah. We're talking about inverting that and say we're going to package this by consent globally yeah. and say these are the people that you can do anything responsible with. That there's no restrictive consent. Yeah. That's an inversion of the packaging. It might require international coordination. If we could get it, you know, so that in one stroke we could replicate the request to all, you know, parties of this consortium and you get approval through one decision, that would be even more awesome. You know, I will hope. You and you've had your hand up a couple times, so. Well, so I, I do think that the place to concentrate on is this broad use, certified user, the broad use zone. I think we've got to leave the, the narrow use people old school my, is my own thing. Because I think if we start trying to protocolize the use process, it's just going to drive us bananas. Um, and I would go back internationally. I don't think that we would have one international DAC. I think that's too much to ask of the communities. But what I do think is a totally feasible scenario is this acknowledgment of, of uh, reciprocation, of uh, recipro reciprocity of each other's certification processes. And so broad use DAC A would, would, would um, uh, honor the, the certification that comes from broad use DAC B, mm -hmm. where A and B are in different countries. So effectively, you have to apply to your country's broad use DAC, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're, then you're done. But, but globally, we could also have a a, a, a inventory of the yes, individuals so that you have access to broad use that they're that we could go back. I mean, to. certainly, 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 the studies can be flagged as whether they're broad use or not. And I know that the uh, well, not just the studies, but the individuals and yeah, the, yeah. So I the variants. About, I mean, I don't. I'm. It's just slightly beyond me to think about whether it should go to the individual level. The studies are no brainer. And the, the Wellcome Trust DAC work in this, effectively, it's a broad use DAC. They've only turned down, I think, two people in the history of applications to the Wellcome Trust DAC. Um, uh, 
so, uh, um, so yeah, that's the that's the that would be the place to start. Right, and, and the reason I'm pushing for individuals is that if we're going to grow this list to the right and add new sources of data through exactly. hospital systems or whatever, we need to think about the process for bringing yeah. new people into broad use. And yeah, so I, th I think it's exactly the way to think about it, right? It's not all the studies that exist now, it's but what's coming. the fact that it's going to grow, if projected, tenfold for the next few years every yes. year, right? And so the problem isn't the narrow people that are there now, but rather making sure that going forward that consent conform to the broad use, because if they're all narrow use, then I mean, this is going to be really I, problematic. Again, I think we're in agreement. I don't think there's Yeah, a, yeah. I'm just, these yeah. are just details, and I'm not... Maybe. Eric. Steve, I like what I hear, but I want to make sure it's not residuals from the bar last night. So you're saying... I didn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that basically by July, we're going to have the ability to have certified users? No. And then the ability to, to access a centralized data set? No. This would be ready. So what by July, I think we could have through the current system we could have access to a standard set of data. But you're still going to have to go through a gazillion approvals. No, one. Yeah. one. So that will be a, a single NIH-wide DAC. For this data set. And I'm just saying it will have both GRU pre-computed p-values, everything okay. that's known, and no, not, But the, the raw data. The, the raw data. The, the, raw data, data. the sequences, the genotypes, the haplotypes. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. We could make July or this fall an ambition to package that coordinate it with all the repositories that want to be in the world and then work out a policy or think about how do we keep extending it. And it's also, it's it's also the phenotypes for, and the phenotypes, phenotypes yeah. for the broad yeah, use. Yeah. Lincoln. Yeah, uh, this all sounds great. July sounds wonderful. Uh, in, in just in terms of the practice, are, so you know that all the, that the DACs for each of these data, these studies are going to, are, are willing and able to relinquish their approval to a broad use that, Yes, that's been discussed and well, this has be been done. in planning for several months internally at NIH. Well, that's great news. Can you just repeat what you just said? Yes. The last line. For several months, this has been in conversation in, in, within NIH, the DACs, figuring out who's in that list. So if I, don't, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, but the permission is not only with the DACs, right? The permission are with the individual studies. I, I, that's, that's been what talked I heard. about too, yes. So individual studies over the next several months are going to allow been, the single NIH DAC to operate. They have been talked. They've already, those conversations have happened. And, it, and I presume that this is basically for existing data, yes. right? It, so there, it could be that in the next set of data that are going to be collected, more data. This will get sort of negotiated ahead of time, so that once it's going to be part of the registration system. So when you submit a study to DBGAP, you can say yes or no. You want to be part of this, and that's being engineered now too. Um, Mike in the front, and then Mark in the back. Okay. And, and so there's a single DAC exist, or the plan for creating this it single exists. DAC? It exists. It, it has been staffed. Yes. Um, so, so a little bit of the security issues around this. Um, is the goal to prototype this when you move to a cloud, or if you move to a cloud, would the goal be to prototype this on like an EC2 system, like do this over at Amazon, and then potentially migrate this towards your own cloud computing environment, that NCBI? Because, because I, I heard you say that there were issues associated with cost of you know growing and shrinking and, and just you know. So for right this now, like we've put 1,000 genomes data into the AWS cloud, the Amazon cloud, for the community to use. It's, it's, it's meant to seed and become human genetics data that's consented for open use. It didn't have their security problems around it, so that was attractive. We could try to see if there's community uptake just to do the computation. You know, and then we can look at uh, what is the right security. There is another working group. I think it was mentioned Vivian Banazzi and Don Prusser on trying to look at uh, 
protections and encryption standards. I don't know if it'll be at NIH. I don't know if it'll be at NCBI. That's an open question. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts in the cost framework. Uh, Irvind. So I, I don't know whether maybe this is morning and the enthusiasm is not coming through, but I, I would say go for it, you know, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning if there are, I think there'll be things to be learned. Maybe there'll be impediments. Maybe there are some challenges we don't recognize, technical and regulatory and otherwise. I mean, um, July is, you know, you can be patient, you know, and, yeah. and, and just go for it. And, and it may be very useful to see what the specific experience and uses. You can always add other pre-computes. So, so, so I think it's part of this is there's a communication plan, and so we're, we're mentioning this in a lot of detail now because you're the target audience. I think almost every one of you would be people we would want engaged in, in using this and kind of understand that this is a... A, a, a different centralized approach and we're going to have to, um, again, work out processes like how do we add new studies in and, and, and that's still in the conceptual planning stage. So it's not completely in whole cloth delivered yet, but it's coming right now. Yeah. So again, I want to echo everybody's enthusiasm for this. I think this is great. And, and I imagine that the other piece of this will be really, really important is communicating with institutions that at the certification process, right? Because I can now imagine that once this happens, the next time I want to submit something to dbGaP, Stanford will say, well, your consent never said that it would go into the broad DAC that was just created last week, right? Because the consents are two years old, even though there the consents did say what it needed to do to go into dbGaP two years ago. So I think there's this continuing sort of issue with the institutions <laughs> that are ever more reticent to certify into dbGaP precisely because they feel like they don't know what they're certifying sometimes. And so I think this is awesome. I'm like so for this because of all the experience that we and others have had. And I just think it's like, it's important to communicate to the institutions and say, look, this is okay, right? You're just certifying it, but because of the consent, like nobody's gonna now go out and you know, the government's not going to turn around and sue you or whatever, right? Because I feel that that's, that's really where a lot of the impediment is going to come from. Not so much what's already in there that you can repackage, but the next time now you want to submit, then there, there's going to be, you know, a hindrance there. They'll say, you know, your consent now, aside from being 15 pages long to include all the information for freedom of information, now we're going to have to add all this other layer and going forward and stuff like that. So I think, I think it's an, an issue to think about. I, I, Debbie. I, I kind of agree with Carlos because they back down and change their minds all the time. But, you know, it might be worthwhile just to get together some of the people who are certifying from some of the major places that you've gotten data from just to get them on board even in a phone conference that this is a change that will occur. It's, you know, what the meaning of it is and how important this is. And even they'll see the benefit, because many of them are just single people, at, even if lots of data is being uh, certified to go into dbGaP. So I think it is important to have a discussion with them about the benefits of this and how it's, it's not a big change. Yeah, I, I think that this is great. And what I would like to do is to have you give us something that we can do a preemptive strike so we can take it to our, you know, our, our VPs of research, whoever it is that signs off on this and tell them this is what's happened. It's all fine. And the next time we put something in, it's just going to be fine. Because I don't want them to be suddenly saying, why didn't you tell us this was happening? And, and that might raise more problems. So I would just like to do a preemptive strike at my institution so that it'll make it easier in the future. Yeah. So all of that, again, as Steve mentioned, will is, is part of the talk, the thinking that we have in our communications plans, the materials that we will need to make available, um, and who we will need to contact. So when this is actually publicly announced, um, that will be available. This is, again, just Steve wanted to, and, and we talked about this in advance, give you all a preview because it was directly relevant to what you were going to be talking about to let you know instead of you being surprised in two weeks when you hear about it because um, it is so on point with what we're doing. And I do, um, we had not talked about having a conference call with some of individual people that were um, doing the certifying. I've, we've talked about 
And I'd been thinking about going to the IRB meeting in December and having this as you know, part of the other general updates that we hope to have by then about things going on with GWAS and with genomic data sharing more broadly, but certainly that's a great idea and would be easy to do. So I will take that back to our group. Uh, the other thing is if, if, if you know that there are big users, you could CC them on the emails that you send to the universities. So if they have questions, they know that these people have been in conversations about this and could provide advice too. Right, and that's something I think that, that actually would come from a different pathway and, and in the sense of working with the ICs and having our IC program folks and, and people reach out to their big users across the different disciplines and different institutes, portfolios. Um, NIH Central can't really do that for everyone, so I can help facilitate making sure that happens for genome investigators, but the other ICs, it would be great for them to do it as well. Pearl has come. Um, I think another way we could potentially get this out, Laura, is uh, Primer, which is the kind of mothership for IRBs, Public Responsibility in Medicine Research, is always looking for webinars to put on, and then those also get archived. So that might, I think if this is big enough, Laura, it might be a good opportunity as it comes down the pike to do something like that as well. Yes, I, I did one last week, but we couldn't talk about it. Um, so, but we can possibly, I think the timing is something we'll need to think about. Yep. It would also be useful if you could uh, prepare some brief slide sets that we could uh, present to our own cohorts because to the extent that we can, they can hear it from us first, yep. uh, they're going to like that better. Okay. I think it's a great idea. Chris? Question about getting back to the, the conversation yesterday about the Homer et al. and, and what, what can be like posted on the web and not. Are the re, uh, research use um, requirements including that you cannot post the results that you actually are, that are actually going to be provided on the web? I mean, what, and maybe, maybe this is some way that we could help address this issue about, about secondary posting or not of the results? So what's imagined right now doesn't change any of the terms of use. It's just packaging the data so it's simpler to get. So there's still, in, in this particular GRU repackaging, there's still the same terms of use that you're not going to identify, you're not going to redistribute, et cetera. I think where we want to talk about risk and what people can see is in this conversation about browsers and analysis and kind of what can we show. And I, I think it's helpful to keep those separate so that we can try to fast track investigator access to the data in a lightweight, fast way, and then have the conversation in parallel. We need a couple parallel conversations here. One is on the risks and harms and how do we adjudicate that and, and try to think about, you know, what, what are cohorts comfortable with seeing? And we've got different uh, groups deciding different things. Maybe we can leverage some of that experience and have some, you know, cohort invested uh, participant discussion. I don't know what the, but we, we need to move that. Uh, we have this idea about putting computation into cloud environments uh, and security and how do we uh, take the next steps in that. I think we're learning with public data, but we're going to need to expand that. We have this idea of um, messaging and, and distributed analysis. And, and so if that's restricted to just the broad use data, like Ewan said, that does simplify part of the triangulation on who can do what. So that's the certified user. Who's, you know, I think Laura mentioned this last night, who's going to do the credentialing, who's going to kind of own the process, how do we stand that up and then, you know, have the international conversations so that we have peers around the world. I think those are all parallel tracks. Yeah, Laura, my. So, so, so you'll have the data set in, in, in July, but it will be a while before you establish a mechanism for user certification. And for a period, this would still be based on a project-specific data access? One project-specific access through the approved user channel will get you to um, all of the data here. And so that would be this package set, the CADA and the broad use. But, 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 but that, would, that could be a very broadly worded uh, uh, project? Yes. Like I want to analyze everything I think yes. of? I, I think so. Laura, yes. you just look? I just wanted to reiterate that, that's, that we might be blending um, initiatives here. So what will happen in July is aggregate data from the 19 existing sets which have appropriate consent and data use limitations will go into a new data set, the CADA data set, that you can make a request through existing <coughs> procedures. Um, just say, I know my, I want to look at um, aggregate data for 
the studies in CADA to do X, Y, Z. That will go to a DAC. It will be reviewed and approved exactly according to all of our processes as we do them now. And then what we are thinking about for the future based on this meeting and based on you know, other things that we have heard is how can we then take this further that would include all of the outreach to institutions, to cohorts, to everyone to think about um, how to bring more data sets into um, what we have, how to make this kind of access possible for individual level data as well if they're approved for general research use. Um, but those are all future steps. What we have right now is this first iterative or, um, or incremental access, which is big and important, and we're looking at it for a period of six months and how we're doing it, and then we'll come back and, and reassess. Add anything more about it, you have to go to this DAC, and, but at least the existence of a variant at that point of interest, would that be possible? I, or I, I Yeah, mean, I, so variants can be due now. I mean, that they just go to DB Snipper, DB Vari, GVA. And then they're, they can be listed to study. If you want p-values, the significant SNPs, the, the important ones, I think that's the conversation about risk because, you know, rare p-values, non-significant p-values might be one thing, but rare variants might have a different set point of risk. And that's what David was saying last night. Yeah. And, so and I don't think we've about, settled on that yet. The question about what's the threshold for... Yeah. So this, this comes back, I think, to, to going towards... Uh, um, being able to post all the p-values, and then there's another question about rare variants because rare variants have this extra identifiability thing. Right. And, and that, I think, is separate from this process. This is a process yes. that's all about um, authorized use, and in fact, it's a trad process. I mean, mm -hmm. There's nothing changing the process at all here. It's just <coughs> creating a kind of meta project which is, which is going to be accessible which, which will have all these uh, projects that have more decent. I don't, I wouldn't, I would really be positive about us also um, not forgetting about trying to be able to post the full list of p values and rare variants on the zone for probably a risk of harm kind of criteria for a project, which is another, which is a sort of orthogonal question to this thing. Right, it's, a, it's orthogonal, but, but, but very important, yes, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so maybe we should go on, Steve. That was yeah. great. Thanks very sure. much.